We live in a divided world. Today's political parties draw lines based on racial, cultural, and religious differences. In our own personal lives, we have established boundaries to protect ourselves. It seems at times that division and separation is the only option. But we, as Christians, have another option. We can show love. We can love like our Father loved us. We can bring about change with love that doesn't require anything from anyone else. God is challenging us to love them anyway. Man, I am so excited. You guys, are, are you enjoying this series, Love Them Anyway? Have you learned something in this thing? Has God been speaking to you? I, I know he's been speaking to me. I mean, the, the core of this series is really that it's about grace. That we're about finding the place where we can begin to start loving people the way God loves them. Right? Not as we've been taught, not of our, as our family has, but as God taught us to love one another and really open that up. This past week, uh, weekend, actually we just got back last night, uh, our, our staff got to go to a conference in Albuquerque. It was a good conference. It was put on by one of the churches there, and we thank you for allowing us to go. It was really breathtaking in some areas and very educational in others. They brought in speakers from all around the country to really pour into us and on a leadership aspect, but also just in, hey, post-pandemic or about reaching people in the right way. It was, it was a really good conference, and we really enjoyed it. One of the speakers, when he was sharing, was kind of talking, it's, it's amazing how God is, right? You know, when they, when they start preaching in somewhere else and you're about to preach it tomorrow, I was like, man, did you just take my sermon notes? I was just trying to, my iPad been compromised, trying to figure that out. But one of the things he was talking about was about, about how we view um, doing things for God. And so he talked about what we call legalism. So today we're going to deal with, the, the, the title of today's sermon is called Your Inner Pharisee. Right? So not, not your Pharisee, the person beside you, but your inner Pharisee, right? We're talking about that. And so he was talking about legalism. And so I thought he gave some really good definitions of what legalism were. Since we're going to kind of talk about it today a little bit, I thought I would share his definitions with you. So he put two definitions up. One is legalism is putting works before salvation. If we say that you have to do something in order to receive salvation, if you're saying that you have to clean yourself up first, or you have to dress a certain way, or say a certain thing, or do a certain thing before salvation is an effort, then that's wrong. He actually used that, that the laws came after the Israelites came out of bondage. They were already free when the laws came. It wasn't the laws first, and then he delivered them out of Egypt. Right? And so that's the deal. First comes deliverance. First comes our salvation. And then comes God sanctifying us and working through things in our lives. Right? So legalism is when we put the cart before the horse and we switch things around and we tell people, hey, you got to clean up before you get here or we got to do those things. The other thing they said legalism was, was when we put leadership standards on people who are not leaders. Right? When we say, because I'm the pastor, I have to do these certain things, and therefore everybody has to do these certain things, right? Or because I'm a leader of an organization, then I have to hold to this standard because I've signed, I've signed papers to be in an organization or I've done certain things. And then we put that on the guy who walks in the door and we tell him he has to do all those things in order to keep coming and being a part of our family rather than it being, hey, leaders are supposed to be a standard before. So think about that as we kind of talk about the different things that the Pharisees are doing in the Bible that Jesus is, is calling them out for, right? Because the trick is what they're doing, on some aspects, they're justifying with the law. They're justifying with what they're doing, but they're really serving themselves with those things and not picking out the things that God really wants them to pick out. So we're going to go to the book of Matthew. We're going to go to Chapter 23, we're going to read the first verse, verse 23, but you'll, if you go to Matthew, you'll notice that there's seven woes there. Woe to the Pharisees, that's what it's called. So this is a chapter called Seven Woes. And woe to the Pharisees is basically Jesus rebuking the leaders of the church at the time and saying, hey, you're not doing this right. Woe to the Pharisees, right? So Jesus does not have kind words often for Pharisees. It's actually very rare that he says anything positive to them, but they don't really say anything positive to Jesus. So we'll get a little bit into that. But he starts out with this one in verse 23. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter 
without neglecting the former, right? So Jesus is, is talking to them and he's giving them a rebuke and he's saying to the religious sect of leaders that what you're doing is that you're tithing on everything in your house and that's okay. He says you should do that, right? He says that's all right, but he says what you're doing is you're, you're tithing on every, every mint, dill, cumin. He says even your spices you're doing. They're taking everything in their cabinet and, and putting out a tenth of it. So tenth is just a math, right? It's just a math standard. A tenth is a tenth. Point one is one over ten. You can divide it into ten parts every time. The reason they were tithing so well, unfortunately, was not because they valued God. They were tithing so well because the Pharisees were religious leaders of the time, and Israel was actually under the Roman Empire, not under their own control. But because they stood up and said, we have a religious objection, and we're going to lead the people because they need God, and we're going to be the standard bearers for them, and we're going to do this, then the only way they got to keep that power was if they actually could prove that they were following the law. So they were, they were taking in everything. And so it's real simple. You know you have to tithe on every ounce of cumin if you have a recorded sale of all the cumin you take into your house from the Roman Empire. Then it's necessary that in order to prove and maintain your power, you tithe, right? And Jesus said, good for you, but you're missing the next point. He says, you're missing the point that, that you're, you're supposed to be doing. He says, Micah 6, 8 says this, He's shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Jesus quotes the scriptures back to them and says, You are holding on to the scripture of a tenth of your tithe, but you're not holding on to it for me, you're holding on to it for the Roman Empire. He says, but what you should be doing is holding on to this scripture, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly for your God. You're missing the bigger picture. You're only doing what's necessary for you to maintain your power and position. And so the reason he's, he's being harsh to the Pharisees is not because they were tithers. Thank God for tithers, right? He's saying you should do that and you should do the other thing. You shouldn't just do one or the other. Look, Christ refers to, to, to Micah, and actually if you go back in Micah, if you wanted to go in your Bible, Micah 7 actually says, aren't we supposed to, he says, what do you want from us, God? Do you want us to give our children? Do you want us to give everything in our house? And he was like, no, 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 that's not what I want. I want you to uphold the law, but I want you to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, or what Jesus calls have faith, be faithful in God in this moment. Right? And so he's say, he tells them, you're, you're kind of missing the point. You're not supposed to stop doing one and do the other. You're supposed to do it all, but your motive needs to be to do it for God, not to do it for your own personal power. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, if, if, if you think tithing is a way that you get things in your life, that's great. But I would caution you to do it in a way that honors God, not because you're there to get. Right? We're generous people because of we know how to act justly, love mercy. We've received these things from God, and we're able to show those to others. We're not doing it. We're not, it needs to be a reflection of God, not just because the law says so or because the book says so. Look, Jesus didn't let them off the hook from tithing, but he did question their motives because that's what their motives were, that they were looking for status, and they were only handling what could be measured, but they weren't doing the immeasurable. They weren't loving. They were just doing what could be measured because that helped them out. So he actually goes on. He has some stronger words for them in verse 24. This is what he says. He says, you blind guides, you no seeing leaders. He says, you strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Jesus is saying, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're, you're cleaning out your spices to get the smallest things out of the way but you're not focused on what the kingdom work is. You're not doing what, what God has for us to do. And he says, and you're supposed to be the religious leaders. You're supposed to be the people that are doing that. And he says, you can't represent me and not do it in the way that it's supposed to be done. You gotta put the first things first and then go from there. Look, Jesus was very angry with them because they made themselves out to be representatives of God. And Jesus was God. And he says, you don't represent me. You're not doing it in the way that it is. Because they had their priorities mixed up. 
Their priorities were not in the right place. They were, they were focused on themselves and, and their own self-power and their own self-little sect of their, their world rather than being focused on, on doing what God had for them, for their country and for their place. Look, a few years ago I listened to a pastor and he was giving a teaching and he gave this list of godly priorities that lines up with the word of God and I was, I was encouraged. Matter of fact, I wrote them all down and I probably taught them in 100,000 different small group settings because I think it matters. It's something we adopted in our life, and I'm, I'm going to put them all up on the screen, and, and you can disagree with me if you want, but it's not really my list. I just, you know, it's the Bible, but we can go through them, all right? So put those guys up on the screen, and I'm just going to leave them there the whole time we walk through them, because th these are the proper priorities based on a biblical set of standards, all right? Your first priority is God. Your first priority if you look at your checkbook and your calendar, if you looked at what's important to you, the first priority you have is God. What God says goes. If God says it, then that's what we have to do. That's, that's where it is. There's not really a question. If you have a conversation with God and you know the voice of God and God says this is what you're supposed to do, do that. You have all the encouragement that I can give you to do it with. That's what you should do. But God should be our first priority. We should actually put him first in life. God's a jealous God. That's what the Bible says. It says he's a jealous God. And, and it's not like jealousy like we think of jealousy, like he's you know, being petty to us because we talk to people or do that. No, he's saying, he's saying, I need to be first. I'm your creator. I, I made you. I love you. The, this is, if you make me first, then I will continue to bless you. Right? The second thing is your spouse. Your spouse is your number two priority in your entire world That's right. right this is these are this is what the bible says and the reason is because your your spousal relationship your marriage is the closest you're going to come to the tr trinitarian relationship that god is where father son and the holy spirit are all one you and your spouse will be the the closest relationship when you do it they do it the bible says you two are one you're joined together you can't separate under god you are two 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 become one and that's that so they have to be right underneath God now God is still above your spouse but your spouse and you are there after that is your children a lot of people get this one mixed up they put their children before their spouse sometimes even God but your children are actually number three and they are they're there because they're your responsibility you have a responsibility to teach them and grow them and lead them in the way that God has for them this is the the idea your job when we dedicate babies or we pray over them the question we ask for a committal is are you going to raise them up in a right age to declare their faith in Jesus Christ, right? This is our job. We have an, a, a, an understanding that we are going to lead them and guide them in the way they need to go. Your fourth one is your family. Now, I know that sounds different because I mentioned your wife and your kids, but your family is your family unit, your nuclear family unit. This is who it is, but it also includes your direct line, which means your parents, your in-laws, right? And, or even, even your siblings, your direct line. This is where they fall. They fall in this place. Your direct line of people who have been with you your whole life or are supposed to be there. This is their, their, their place. Below your children, below your spouse. Is that a hard one? Just below your children, below your spouse. Some of you are like, no, I really don't like my in-laws. That's cool. You know, drop them a little lower. You know. But they're there, all right? And then, uh, and then the fifth one is your church. You, the Bible commands us to be involved in the community of God. We are supposed to be a member of the body of Christ working together with other members to form the body of Christ and doing that. We have an obligation to be responsible in our community that God has called us to be in. And we do this through church. This is the gathering of the people that we do. Um, and, you should, and you should make your schedule accordingly, right, to do that. You're, so now we're on six. Your six is your job. Wow, seems like, seems like that's an easy one to get out of priority, right? Sometimes our job it gets, gets elevated really quickly above family, above our spouse, above things, because we justify it, right? Like, well, if I don't, if I don't go to work, then my kids won't eat, right? And if I don't do it, no one's asking you not to go to work. We're asking you to hold it in the proper priority as things go, all right? Which, notice it's below your church. Did you, did you see that one? Okay. Now, I'm not self-serving. I'm just telling you how the biblical priorities work out. Number seven is your hobbies. You should enjoy your life. You should enjoy your life. You should go do that. Play golf if you like to. I don't know. Play pinochle if that's what you like. Do, do something that gives you some type of joy. Enjoy your time. Number eight is your extended family. Your extended family 
becomes your grandparents, your cousins, your auntie, right? Your uncles, these are extended family. They are not your immediate family, nor are they your nuclear family. They, aren't, they, they actually fall below you having some self-care and ability and your job, this is where they are. I love my grandma, but she has like 40 grandchildren. I'm not the one, okay? I mean, I can be the one, I don't mind if she fits in my priority, but I don't have to be the one. She got 40 grandkids, somebody's priority is gonna line up for her, all right? <clears throat> then you get number nine, which is your, your friends. I know, that's the tough one, right? Your friends are at number nine. That seems low, right? Well, I remember a conversation we had with our daughter when she was about to graduate high school and she was really concerned about if she was gonna to get to go to school with her friends, if she was ever gonna, these friends were gonna do this, everything her friends needed to do somehow factored into her decision. And I remember just looking at her dead in the eye and be like, hey, five years from now, you ain't even gonna know those people. I, I just wanna be really clear with you. Five years from now, you won't even know where they live, right? You probably won't even have their phone number. I know that's sad, but they ain't gonna text you every day when you get out of high school. They're not gonna do it. And can I be honest with you? As, a, as you're an adult, five years from now, you ain't gonna know those people. The people that are important are the people in your house, the priority list that God's given you, right? Lifelong friends is, is good, but they're few and far between. And they have a place, it's called number nine. All right? <laughs> Number 10 is everyone else. After you get through that list and you put your priorities, number 10 is, is everyone else. Now, I, I did some research on the internet, right? I did, I, I know how to Google. I went out there and I put stuff in there and I was like, tell me some priority lists. What's, what's the world saying about priority lists? Do you know what the number one thing on most priority lists is? Self-care, you do you. That's what the world preaches. You take care of you first. You make sure that you're exercising, you make sure you're doing, exercise was up there in the top four, like on most lists, right? I know we want everybody to be healthy, but it's not on my list, right? It's in a hobby, okay? And then you have the other one, and then you're looking at, but I was looking at the other thing, and friends was generally two or three or four on every list I pulled up on the internet. Man, what kind of, your friends are above your family, your grandparents, your, you know, really? This is how we view the world. This is what the world teaches us. Put your friends first. People you aren't gonna know five years from now, you should forsake the people that are closest to you in order to do that. It's really interesting to, to look at what the world preaches versus what the biblical list of priorities actually is. And I know you've been taught different orders and you probably have your own set up priority list, but the truth is, is but by reorganizing our prior priorities in the way God wants us to live, that's how we maintain the proper relationships with people. That's how we put them in the proper order, and we know who we're supposed to be doing and loving in the first place. And we know who we're supposed to be able to extend a hand to and who not. For example, in our home, we have set it up where these, this is our priority list. We live our lives by this. I know you're like, well, where's your congregants, Pastor? Uh, you know? It's a great question, right? But for us, it's in my job, I have a job, right? But when we're looking at this list, we make decisions in our family based on this list. And we have conversations as a spousal unit. This is our, I have conversations with God. God, I feel like I'm not in the right priority with these people, how do I do this? Because I wanna match up to what God has for us. So this is it. When, when, we, when we bounce up against a priority decision, Sometimes we politely decline to assist a friend based on a family need. Sometimes we tell them, sorry, you're below the line today. I have other needs. If, if my mother needs $100 and my, and my daughter needs $100, mom, you're out. Right? That's just how the priorities list up. Because I have someone who is my responsibility, and mom, you got eight kids. Keep calling. Amen. Just depends on our priority, right? We have to help our children. Look, if my job needs me to work Sunday, but church is the day that my community gathers on Sunday, on Sunday, then my job is out. 
I have a responsibility to my community. I'm a member of the body of Christ. That's right. Right? If my auntie needs help, needs me to help her move, but my job scheduled me, sorry, auntie, you're out. You're below the priority list. Right? But when you make these decisions based on biblical understandings, are, you know what? Setting up clear boundaries and priorities. That I've been saying it for weeks. When people are asking me questions, I'm like, hey, you know it's real easy. Put it in your priorities. Put it in your boundaries. See how it shakes out. Right. We're, str we're straining over a gnat rather than taking care of the big things. Yeah. We're worried about what our friend's going to say instead of worried about what God's going to say. Jesus is standing in front of them and saying, hey, you're worried about the Roman Empire more than you're worried about God. Your priorities are out of whack, Pharisees. Woe is what comes to you when your priorities are out of whack. Jesus is telling them, if you're going to do this, if you want to live the law, I'm not, he's not saying the law of the Old Testament is bad. He's not saying what's written in the Bible you shouldn't do. He's saying you should do it all. That if you want to be a city on a hill and the light in the darkness like he's calling us to be, then we got to live justly, right? Act humbly. we got to do it. we got to love mercy. we got to do those things so that we can be that light. Because if there's not a difference between the way you're living your life and the way the world is living your life, they're not coming to God. Right. If they got everything you got... But you, but you claim to be religious, there's no difference between your life and theirs. If you put your priorities in line, then this causes questions. Well, why, why would you put them above me? Let me show you my list my pastor gave me. It's right here. You're over here. Right? And, and they're going to know a difference because you've made a difference between serving God and serving them. Right? Look, if you really want to make a difference in their lives, pray for them. Pray for them. Pray they see right priorities. Pray their life change because if you want to change their hearts, that's the only way to do it. Praying for the lost will change their hearts. God will change their hearts. It's not going to be because you gave them preferential treatment. It's going to be because God is doing the work in their lives. Amen? So the Pharisees, he goes on, he tells another woe in verses 27 and 28. I'll read them to you. Again, there's like seven woes in this chapter, so you can really look at them. I don't have time to preach that to you this morning. Um, but it says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead, and everything is unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside... You are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. He says, you're playing around. You're, you're showing yourself to be something that you're not. Your heart is wicked, but you're worried about the appearances that other people think about you, rather than worried about what God cares about your heart. And look, this story actually is in Luke. It's a little bit longer. Matthew, again, summarizes these woes that Jesus said, but in the, this woe actually comes from a story in Luke where Jesus is actually invited to the house of a Pharisee to come and eat dinner. And when he shows up to eat dinner, he walks in there, and I guess Jesus was hungry, him and his disciples, because they go straight to the table and start eating. That's what they do. And the Pharisee is like, hey, 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 how come you and your disciples, if you're such religious people, don't wash your hands ceremonially before we eat the food? And Jesus then tells them, you're a whitewashed tomb. You're worried more about if I wash my hands than about if I have nourishment or if that we're doing the work of the kingdom of God. He says you're putting your, your emphasis on the wrong syllable, right? You're not putting the right things in the right order. And he, and he really just tells them, hey, look, we, you want to honor traditions, but you also want to honor God. You, and, and Jesus gives them this thing where he really just lays into them. The whitewashed tombs one is... Jesus, you know, I know your Jesus is always nice, right? You know, Jesus is blunt. Blunt. Look, I, was one, I once had a pastor tell me this story where they went on a trip to the Holy Land. And they were, they, were at, they were on the Temple Mount. And they were there with other pastors and other followers of Christ. And they were there. And there's a little group of them. And one of the guys goes, hey, we should do communion right here on the Temple Mount. Right? And they said it was like a Holy Spirit moment. People were like, yes. This is what we should do. 
this is amazing because I got the stuff. And they're like, cool. So these guys are standing around, and one guy's beginning to prepare the communion. And as he gets there, they notice that he's actually filling the cups with wine instead of grape juice, right? And he says, and slowly by surely, some of the pastors start going, oh, oh, wait a second. I signed a paper that said I would never touch alcohol, so I can't. I can't take communion with you in this Holy Spirit moment. And another one in his pride stands up and says, I've never touched alcohol in my life. I can't take that wine today in this moment. And the truth is, they had a holy moment. This is what, my, this is what the pastor is telling me. Sir. They have a holy moment. And they opted out by straining at a gnat and missing the opportunity to in a God-ordained moment. I don't want to be that type of Christian. I don't want the pride that I'm the best, that I'm the pastor to stand in the way of having a Holy Spirit moment with anyone. Right? I, I don't want, I don't want my, my, my laws and rules that I've put on a piece of paper for my own personal standards standing in the way of me meeting, leading another person to Christ or being in a Holy Spirit moment. I want to recognize this is, what, this is why Jesus was so mad at the Pharisees. God is in your house. He's sitting at your table. You can ask him anything you want. You can do anything that you need right now. You're about to eat dinner with the living God. And all you care about is if I wash my hands. We miss the big moments by straining at the small things. Because our priorities become out of whack. Look, it doesn't make you more holy to pray over each meal. I think you should, right? I pray over my meals. But it doesn't make you more holy. What makes you more holy is that you want to offer what you're about to partake to God first. Right? It, does, it doesn't make you more holy to attend both services at church. I like the house full too. But it doesn't make you more holy. But you know what? If you have a heart of worship and you want to worship every opportunity there is to worship, that's good. Right? You should do that. Nothing makes you more holy. Holy is holy. That's it. Holy has a definition. Set it apart for God. If you're set apart for God or you're set apart for the use of the Father, that means holy. It's not about actions that you do, hand washing, tithing, whatever. It's not about you're the best at this. It's about if you're set apart for the use of the Holy Spirit. That's what holy means. And that's what he is. Look, often our inner Pharisee demands, demands different thoughts about how we think should church, church should go, right? We think, well, if they don't worship the way I worship, then they probably aren't serving the same God, right? Well, they, they, you know, they used to be Catholic and they used to be Episcopalian and these people have been Pentecostal their whole life. It don't matter. Serve God. Serve God. Anyone who comes to, we often think that anyone who comes to the Father differently than us, than they're wrong. Well, God delivered me of that from day one. It took them two years to do it. Good. At least they, God delivered them. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. We, we, we strain it in that instead of looking at the big things. Look, we don't have a dress code here. We, we, don't, we don't have a dietary plan that we want you to follow, you know? We, we, don't, we don't offer you anything other than just Jesus. That's what we got. We got Jesus, right? There's no requirements. There's no this. But I believe God, God will police the church. God will do your heart. The best thing I can do is get you filled with the Holy Spirit because God will begin to change you. I don't got to mess with it. I'll see changed lives because God is working on you. It's got nothing to do with what we prescribe as a prescription for coming to church. It's got to do with if we can get you close to the one who can make change. We are in the loving people business. That's what we're here to do. We're here to love people. And let God do the work that he has. You guys can go ahead and come back up. <clears throat> I want to tell a story. On Veterans Day, we had a gentleman come into, the, come into our service. And he was, uh, he was in a wheelchair. And he was a veteran. And 
he didn't look like us or act like us. He he's obviously came. Someone invited him, actually, and he came, and it was such a blessing. And, and I love, I loved him. His name was John, and I want you to know on Veterans Day, he rolled straight up to the front. He sat right here. He, he didn't try, he wasn't a back row question, and he came straight up. You know, first time in the building and walked all the way, went all the way up here. And then, then we even played, remember on Veterans Day, he was a veteran, and we played the veteran song, and you're supposed to stand on, on your, when your branch of service. John stood up for them all, right? Got out of his wheelchair and stood up. You know, and we're like, John, which one are you, man? And you're, you know, I don't know, you know, so. And then he was there, and then after, after that, he, he, I met him in the lobby after the first service, and he just told me as we handed him a button and said he was a veteran and gave him a sticker and gave him an army man, and he was just telling me how much he really enjoyed everybody that was at our church. How he came in and all he felt was just the love of God wrapped around him in this place. And he stayed for second service, and it was really cool. He sat there again. He still didn't stand up at the right time. He was a Marine. Sometimes that's how Marines go. You know what I mean? But he, he, he was there, and, uh, and he, stayed for, he stayed for second service, and he really enjoyed it. And, you know, at, at the end of second service, I, I prayed a blessing over everyone. And as I was making my way back to the back, and sometimes it's kind of a minefield depending on who needs to talk to me. And as I was making my way back to the back to go shake some hands and do some stuff, one of our members runs up to me and grabs me by the arm and says, Hey, can we pray for John? today I look back and John's just surrounded by people in our church and he says can we pray for John today John's about to have a surgery and he really needs some prayer and I just want to know if we could pray with him and I said you bet and I turned around and I came back and we surrounded John and we just like 10 people just laid their hands on him and we just prayed for John and, and he and he left knowing that we, that we cared for him that we prayed for him and that, that he had a Holy Spirit moment with Jesus in that time Right? I, I love that moment. I took note of that moment. I said, man, this is what church looks like. That you can roll in here. You can do it all wrong. You can sit in somebody's seat. Right? You can sing off key. Would you please sing off key? Please? These guys sing too good. I don't need to hear it behind me too. Break it up. Right? right? I want you, let's do it all wrong. Let's come in just with a heart that says, God, we're here. Whatever you have for us. You can receive from everyone here whatever they have to offer. If you have a need and you need urgent prayer, we're going to do it. We'll turn around whatever we're doing and we'll get there. Leave changed, right? That's what we're after here. Man, it's, it's those moments. That's what church is. That's what loving them anyway looks like. I, I don't care who you are or what you do, just, just come be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. And I want to pray for some groups today. There are some of you here today who, man, you've really been self-righteous, if I can be honest with you, right? You've got your own list and criteria of things that you're doing and not doing. But God says you're missing the bigger picture. You're missing the bigger picture. I want to pray today that God will help you act justly, love mercy, walk humbly before him today. That you'll that you put your priorities in the right order. Because there are some of you here whose priorities are all out of whack. Right? You got your job at one and friends at two. Right? You're all out of, you're all out of there and you're wondering why it's not working. I'm going to pray today that God will just help you reset your priorities the way he wants them to be set. And in that, you'll begin to see a change. And I'm going to pray that it's an easy transition, because sometimes it ain't easy. I'm going to pray that it's an easy transition. And lastly, I want to pray for those who found a place today where God showed them the love that they needed to feel. Today, you want to make a decision. And you want to say, today's my day. I feel like God loves me, and today I want to pray with you that you, God will come into your life change things in a new direction just like you did for me and for everybody else in the body of Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you so much for this moment at church today. Lord, I thank you that if we extend love to the world, God, you'll keep sending them to us. Lord, I ask that you would just plant a new thing in our hearts today. Change lives, restore relationships, 
do it today, Lord. Lord, I want to lift up these prayed people today, those who are self-righteous in their own self. Lord, they're checking off their own list every day. Lord, I pray that you release them from that today. Lord, that you would teach them to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before you today, God. I pray that you would help them. Lord, I want to pray for those whose priorities are out of whack. Lord, I pray that you would anoint them to restructure their priorities, that you would give them a reset in their life, Lord, and that you would allow them to see the right path, to see how to handle their relationships in the way that you desire them to be in. Lord, I pray today that you would do that. And lastly, Lord, I want to pray for the person here today, persons, Lord, here today, who decided to make a commitment toward you. Lord, today they said that they've heard about a God that they didn't even know existed. They've heard about a Father who loves them unconditionally, and they don't have to do it all right first, but that you're going to deliver them first and then work on you. Lord, I pray with them today. Lord, I pray we've been a terrible manager of our life. I've been a terrible manager of my life. Lord, I'm riddled with sin. I ask that you would come into my life, touch my heart, make me whole, and change me. Make me white as snow today, Lord. Give me a new lease on life, Lord, as I put you as my number one priority today. That, God, you're my Father. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I put you in the right place today. Lord, I ask that you would begin a work in me that won't stop. Lord, I believe that you've that you came to this earth, that you died, you were buried, and you resurrected on the third day. But God, I believe that you're coming back again, and there's an eternal life and an eternal salvation that I can have with the confession of my mouth. And today I make that confession, Lord. Lord, and I ask that you would just move in my life forever. Lord, you are my Lord and King forever. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you guys stand with me and worship today?